Thank you for staying with us on our Independence Day special program. On this segment, we will be talking about how relevant is this independence that we celebrate? How has it benefited us? I'm being joined by legal practitioner Ahmed Abbas. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. We've had so much complaints over the years from pre-colonial to post-colonial to independence. We still have challenges, we still have problems. One begins to wonder, what is the relevance of our independence if we cannot do good by ourselves with the freedom that we have? Well, I think um, from as a student of history, um, our independence is basically in form and not in substance as we speak because it is, as far as I'm concerned, as a stakeholder in this enterprise called Nigeria, what we have is basically um, transfer of colonialism from external forces to internal forces. Apart from the years between 1960 and 1966 that we had robust governance. Governance that was competitive between the regional governments. UI came into existence in Western region. The Eastern region quickly sat down and competitively brought about University of Nigeria in Soka. And the Northern region competitively sat down and brought about Amadou Bele University. So those were times that governance actually impacted the people's life. But post-1966 till date, I would say we are actually still trying to find our bearing as a people. Corruption had set in. There's so much dissolution in the society today. Insecurity, kidnapping, terrorism, unemployment, educational breakdown and all the rest of so much deficit of trust between the major ethnic groups, everybody mistrusting this and all the rest of them. And uh, you just discover the leadership classes are today are actually also expropriating the resources of the state to their personal benefit, which was what the colonial masters actually did. Hijack the apparatus of state for personal self-benefit. That is exactly what we are still having. That's why today you have, me, we, we just were told that we become the, um, the, the poverty, poverty capital of the entire world. It means that Nigerians have actually not benefited from the so-called independence that we have. And then if you also look, most times when you interrogate the conversation of our elders, those who saw independence, who went to school post-independent, sometimes they wonder, they keep talking about the good old days. And when a nation begins to say its past, it's better than the present. That means there's a problem that we need to go back to the drawing table and say, where did we miss the way? Because God created society and human beings to make progress. You should say our present is better than our past. But when you see a society or a nation keep saying their past is better than their present, they must look at each other in the eyes and say, there's some things that we're actually not doing very right. Is there something we can take from the past and bring to the present to help address this issue of independence? Because we, we, we keep talking about poverty. Poverty has been with us for as long as I can remember, and it's still here. We have the issue of corruption. We have the issue of a tribalism. We'll take them in piecemeal. But what you said triggered my thinking that is there something we can take from the past and bring to the present and modify it to enhance this sense of independence, the relevance of it to us today? You see, the vice president sometimes gave a lecture where he said, you see, there are pillars, value systems that ensure the growth development and progress of a society. When you compromise those values, they are the pillars of the society. Pillars like honesty, integrity, hard work, trust. When you take away these pillars, you do not have, you can't guarantee progress in any society. As of today, in those days, our, 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 our parents, our elders will tell you, those were days that were told in the market, you can actually leave your goods Cover it the following market day. You will come. Nothing will be missing. But I tell you, today, if you sit with your goods, with your two eyes open, 
the rest are sure they will steal the goods, steal you. I mean, what is kidnapping today? <laughs> Kidnap you and keep you in one place and call you with audacity. <laughs> they will call your family members. <laughs> and say, well, she's in our custody. We are demanding 80 million naira. Let us start negotiation. A police DPO was arrested of recent in one of the states. He had to pay 3 million naira for him to be released. He simply tells you that our value system had broken down over the years. We now have a generation that doesn't want to work. And when Mahatma Gandhi was listing the seven deadly social sins, one of them he mentioned was wealth without work. When you find a society that doesn't believe in hard work, we're told that Japan, after the World War, went to America to understand why is the West progressing. And what they came out with was that you get paid per hour. So if you show up in your place of work for three hours, you get paid for three hours. If you like, you can tell them that your mother is sick and go home your pocket. That's why well, sometimes we think those who live in the Western world, America and Europe, that they are stingy. They work even during the winters. Work is like a life, it's like a religion. It's like an opium. You don't work, you don't eat. We don't have work culture. So those are some of the things. You see everybody wants to be a multi-billionaire. Sometimes you look at somebody wants to be a dangote. Do you know how many years dangote has put into hard work? So many of them. So what I'm trying to say is that our value system has broken down over the years. The institutions that were set up are not working. They are not regulating anything. And so everybody is just doing whatever they are, they are doing. We've been saying that corruption is like, it, it has become a culture in Nigeria. But the question is how many people are actually going to jail for corruption? You see somebody accused of corruption. They are in the court for the next 10, 12, 13 years. The judges keep retiring. They start the novel. And after some time, the witnesses are no longer there. And after some time, the, the cases are thrown away. The man that we know, the society knows, the community knows, has actually embezzled state funds. He's given Chief Tassi title. He goes back to the normal, I mean, to a normal life. And so the youths are simply just looking at it and said, does hard work really pay? Because the best way is by living, by giving, living by example. So we have people in those days, the, the Michael Ajassins of this world, the Jack Andres of this world, the Sheu Shagaris of this world, the Alessia Kweme of this world, they went into politics, they served. Even though their government was tagged to be corrupt, some way, but as individuals, we can actually say some of them came out poorer than they went in because they had integrity. But as of today, politics without principles, you see a national assembly that is saying there's nothing wrong with buying cars with 4.5 billion era in an atmosphere of poverty, in an atmosphere of lack of employment, and all the rest of them, for God's sake. That's why you see your younger, the younger, the workforce, the middle class. I hope you are aware, as a media house, that we are the, I mean, Nigeria is the highest, I mean, migration nation that leave out the country. To the West. And these are your graduates, your middle class. Why? Right? Because it's choking. The economy is choking. The society is choking. You are not creating opportunity for young to engage your young men in productivity and all the rest of it. And the society is going to suffer in future. The, 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 let's look at the issue of, uh, you've, you've touched a bit on it, but we, we still have the issue of corruption yes. uh, with us. And apparently, there is effort. Countless governments come and they say they want to fight corruption. This administration has come and they say they are fighting corruption. Because we're looking at the relevance of our independence, I'm going to ask, what is your assessment of the fight against corruption over the years, not just on this administration, and the effect it is having on our nationhood? Is it your assessment, basically? Each government that comes tries to fight corruption. But corruption is not what one government can fight. Corruption is not what the president can fight. Corruption is a war that must involve all the citizenry. And corruption is a war that the law enforcement agents must be the arrowhead. They must be above board. But let me tell you the honest truth. Sometimes I pity your law enforcement officers, like the inspector general of police, hardworking man, but the honest truth is that he can't be everywhere. Those surrounding him, do they also have the integrity? Because I can tell you firsthand 
that those that are saddled with the responsibility of fighting corruption and enforcing laws against corruption, they themselves are corrupt. I can say, I'm saying it on air. The IG might not know all the departments. Why do you think we, we, we established EFCC? It's because the police failed along the line. We started creating multiple organizations, overlapping functions, because one is failing. When you are a leader and you are surrounded by men who do not have your vision and who do not advise you, I can tell you, I'm a practicing lawyer. There are many departments of the police force, as of today, that do not even have an iota of knowledge of what it takes to be a police officer. They aid and abet. They do not do their investigation very well. They are also corrupt. And law and order is the foundation of any society. When you do not have a robust law enforcement, people do whatever they, they like and go scot-free. In advanced country, it is not as if Americans are not criminals. It's not as if Australians are not criminals. There is nowhere. Human beings are the same everywhere. But they are, their institutions are so robust that no matter who you are, if you violate their laws, the law will catch up with you. You will be prosecuted. Well, leadership you will be is sent what determines. Jail. It sends a deterrent. It sends a strong message that the law is a lie. But here, people commit all manner of impunity. Even the law officers themselves, they are neck deep in corruption. You will see criminals hobnobbing with senior police officers, writing petition, and on the basis of that, petition writing is a big business, big industry in Nigeria. In case you are not aware, you see people fighting, criminals fighting and writing petition, using the police force to harass innocent citizens, violating their rights, when you have that kind of society. There's a big problem. So the society, the government must empower people to be able to stand for their rights. Let me tell you, let me give you a typical example. The, the, the police will always tell you that bail is free. <laughs> let me just start from that basic fundamental of what is, see, what is sickening about this society. They will tell you, let any police DPO or area commander or police commissioner come to this studio and look at me eyeball to eyeball and tell me that there is a divisional police that you do not pay bribe to get somebody out, whether you are innocent or not. It's sickening. The president cannot help us to do that. And that's why some of us who are also lawyers must stand and tell police officers when they ask for bribe that, no, it's not my, I won't, I won't be part of that sickness. But integrity is not something you acquire overnight. It's something that, is, that you grow over the years. So how can we, as a sort of a, a way to, you know, rebrand ourselves and encourage pride in our nationhood, bring integrity back to public offices? Is that, it even a possibility? Very simple. Institutions are the arm of government for giving people the requisite value system with which to live. Because man by nature has the tendency to be lawless. What prevents people from being lawless? In advanced countries, those of us who break traffic lights in Nigeria, who violate traffic lights in broad daylight, you can't do that abroad because the cameras are there to capture you, and you know they will send you your fine. And if it is prison, imprisonment, you will go to jail in advance country because they respect their law. Until our institutions function the way they should function. And institutions, strong institutions, are built by strong men. What I mean by strong men is you allow competent people over the years to run an institution and imbue it with the culture required for it to attain its objective. And when a strong man, an ethical man, a competent man runs an institution without interference from government, when he's about to go, he already on that, he knows those who also have the same culture. You seek his impute in who takes over from you. But how do we how do we work with this when we have a pull him down uh, syndrome in this country where you see somebody making an effort to change um, a situation and then you find people looking for ways to pull that person down maybe because that person is blocking you know something that is coming to them so how can we deal with that because it, we I don't I don't doubt yes. that we have at least the men of integrity in this country this the supervisory agencies and institutions, when they are also people by ethical men and women, 
it will forestall such occurrence. Can I give you a, a practical example? Let me just give you a practical, in case, there's a case presently in Queen's College where people were spreading rumor that there's an epidemic in the school. Please, you are a media house. Go there and conduct investigation and see whether there's an epidemic. There is a clash of ego. Somebody believes he's the PTA chairman and because the, the principal is probably not dancing to his tune. The syndrome of bringing her down. Writing all manner of frivolous petition. Somebody bullying a, a, a principal of a school simply because you think the woman is too ethical for your liking. And the next thing you think you want to do is bring her down. All manner of lie that there were 300 students that have been um, that, that have, you know, one way or the other, left the school because of one epidemic outbreak. Ministry have of you, Health officials. Been there yourself? Ministry of Health officials have been there. As I speak with you, you are a media house. I'm on air. If I'm lying, you can actually. You are into. You, you can go there. That, yes. You can call the Ministry of um, Lagos, Ministry of Health. They visited the school to find okay. out. So, are you understand? So yes. now, it's left for the supervisory agency, the Federal Ministry of Education. To say no, what is happening is actually blatant lie. And the old girls association of the school also sent in their own old girls for to inspect the school. And they've actually issued a press release that all that is out in the media is actually fabricated. That there were 73 students who came in, had malaria, and flu. Went home to their parents. Some of them are back on campus. How 73 became 900 in the media? Punch carried 900 syndrome of pulling them down. That's why supervisory institutions must be very ethical by men and women that will be dispassionate. Look Including at issues, the media. The media and said, no, this is the true fact. Why do you listen to one side of the story and publish it? Because in, in, in a country like Nigeria, when you have people who want to be ethical in a corrupt system, they'll try to bring you down. So we, what, what is the way forward? Because we cannot continue. To, we are 59 years old. That's we why, cannot continue to be this way. That's why I said this is not a war that only the, what do you call it, the government, the president himself can win alone. ESCC Everyone cannot win the war. Everyone has to be involved. If, look, I'm a lawyer, for example. Let me just tell you, I have told several police officers I will not, under any circumstance, give you bribe money to bail somebody. If you think he has a case, take him to court. I prefer that. That's my, what we are my, fighting. My worry with the aspect about the government yes. is that big elephant in the room of them not obeying, um, you know, court orders, yes. obeying the rule of law, yeah. so, so to speak. And that has an overriding effect on the psyche of the people and this sense of what is the relevance of our independence if our government does not uh, protect the rule of law. What is your take on that? I, I think for those who have the opportunity like this, to speak, and those who are also advising the president, they must keep telling the president what goes around will surely come around one of these days. Impunity in any society is not something I pray for anybody to be uh, to be a victim okay. of. It is when you when when you when you when impunity is allowed to reign, it dehumanizes people. That's why those who crafted democracy said democracy must be on the basis of rule of law. You, the legislators, will make the law. The executives will execute the law. And when there's a conflict in the society, it is the judiciary that will interpret. If you say a man is an enemy of the state, you cannot just incarcerate the man, take him and lock him up and say that I think this man is a danger. No, you have to take him to court and oh, say, court. I, 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 based on facts before me, I think this man is a danger to the society and we need to keep him out of circulation. If the court says no, by the evidence before me, this man is not a danger to the, release him. It is incumbent on the government, including the president. And I'm actually using this opportunity to call on President Muhammad Buhari. A lot of people voted for you because they believe that you are going to take this nation forward. But flouting rules of, I mean, judgments of the and court orders under any guise, especially in an administration that have a professor of law, it doesn't all go well. I don't mind there are two schools of thought who believe yeah. this government is good, this government is not. No, what we are saying is Follow once the, the court law. makes a pronouncement, it is incumbent on everybody to follow. Then if you, if you disagree, 
obey force and go and appeal. I, I really would have loved to ask you the question on uh, tribalism and how we, you know, we trans, we can remove that. Instead of saying I am Igbo first or I am Yoruba first, I would say I am Nigerian when I'm asked to introduce. But if you can just speak on that on 30 seconds, please. We're out of time. Those, can we, those, yes. Is that scenario changeable? It is changeable when you take away ethnicity and religion from evaluating people. When you take away, if I'm applying for anything in Nigeria, stop asking me where's my state of origin. Stop asking me whether I'm a Muslim or not. Because the leadership class, they know what they are doing. When they go into the cockpit of an aircraft, they do not ask the pilot which tribe, <laughs> what are, you? tribe you are. When their children are attending Oxford and Cambridge, they do not ask whether the teacher is a Christian or is a or Muslim. Muslim. Thank you so much God for coming you. on the program. Thank I appreciate you. your thoughts. Thank you. And that's our independent special program. Please send us your comments and contribution on our social media platforms. I will be back with Plus Politics at 7 p.m. Please do join us and thank you very much for your time so far.